be with you this morning. <clears throat> As you uh, can see on your bulletin cover, this morning we're going to be talking about the unstoppable world Christian movement, some of the things that God is doing in the world today. And as the base for uh, our message, we're going to be looking at a passage in Colossians chapter 1. So if you want to turn there, if you have your Bibles, if not, it's going to be on the screen. Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 3, <clears throat> a book that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to the brothers and sisters there in Colossae. And he said, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, the love you have for all the saints, because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. You've already heard about this hope in the message of truth, the gospel that has come to you. It is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and recognized God's grace in the truth. You learned this from Epaphras, our dearly loved fellow slave. He is a faithful servant of the Messiah on your behalf and has told us about your love in the Spirit. The Unstoppable World Christian Movement, when I looked up the definition of a movement, the dictionary described it as this, a series of actions or activities tending toward a particular end or a diffusely organized group of people tending toward or favoring a common goal. <clears throat> Movements are part of the social landscape of the world in which we live today. The next slide, I just put up some of the movements when I did a search, I went to Wikipedia, and if you look at social movements, there's a list about this long. And I just thought I'd remind you of some of the movements that maybe we're familiar with, maybe we're not. One of the most impactful in our country, the civil rights movement. For those of you that go back a few years, the charismatic movement when we debated about should we speak in tongues and all those things, that movement's long gone. Movements rise, movements fade. Others there I'm sure you'll recognize, the Tea Party, the Arab Spring, which was a very hopeful movement, which unfortunately did not turn out the way many people thought across the Arab world. The student volunteer movement, that's a movement that had its heyday in the last century, a missions movement among students that mobilized 20,000 students to the ends of the earth. Movements come and movements go. And Paul was writing here to the believers in Colossae, Paul himself never went to Colossae. He had never been there. He had sent one of his team, Epaphras, to go and help start a church in the city of Colossae. So he was instrumental in planting this church, but he himself had never been there. So he felt it was important to write to them, encourage them, and address some doctrine, some issues that they were struggling with. <clears throat> So in his opening remarks here, Paul says that the gospel, the message about Christ has made its way to the Colossians and he said, as it's made its way to you, it's literally growing and bearing fruit all over the world. And I love that phrase. Bearing fruit and growing. Bearing fruit means the gospel is fertile. The gospel is bringing forth, wherever it's planted, it's bringing forth a harvest of souls. And then it's growing. It's enlarging in its territory. It's increasing around the world and becoming greater. The gospel of Jesus Christ is an organic movement that goes across the world 
often unseen, and yet it's there. The statement that Paul makes here is pretty incredible. The movement that began with Jesus Christ and his earliest followers was spreading throughout the known world of that day. And Paul said, I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters in Colossae, with this news, the gospel is spreading. And this is something the Colossians were obviously not really aware of. They didn't know the extent of that gospel advance. Maybe they thought they were unique. Maybe they thought the gospel had only come to their corner of the world that it was something for them to enjoy and be thankful for, that Jesus had come to them, saved them, they were on their way to heaven. But this movement called Christianity, started by Jesus and a small group of people in Palestine 2,000 years ago, it's become the world Christian movement. <clears throat> In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus declares, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the forces of Hades will not overpower it. <clears throat> when we look at the context of that passage, we realize right before that, Jesus had said to the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they gave a lot of answers, but Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus then replies and says, Peter, you're absolutely right. And upon this rock, upon the bedrock of this confession, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, I will build my church. The gates of Hades are not going to overpower it. That is a promise that we can take to the bank as believers in Jesus Christ, the forces of evil and Hades and the devil will try, but they will not overpower the unstoppable movement of the church of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And so we see the church of Jesus Christ is an unstoppable movement that is driven by the wind of the Holy Spirit. It has the wind of the Holy Spirit in its sails. Its influence has reached every nation on earth in some way. Though sadly, there are still two billion people, two billion who have little or no access to the message of Christ and its life-changing benefits. If they wanted to hear the message, it would be extremely difficult because it's not yet accessible in their culture. <clears throat> but this unstoppable world Christian movement continues its growth trajectory around the world today, and we, like the Colossians, may not be aware of all that God is doing in the world but make no mistake, God is at work in this world in powerful ways. We're not going to hear it on CNN. We're not going to hear it on Fox News. We're not going to see it in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution or even the Fayette Citizen. We're not going to even see it probably on Facebook. But God is doing wonderful things in our world. And I want to share some of the things that he is doing today. <clears throat> Even the organization that Rita and I and some others in this room serve with, Operation Mobilization, based over in Tyrone, OM started as a movement. OM began with an ordinary housewife named Dorothea Clapp. And Mrs. Clapp was a woman of prayer. She had four sons, and Mrs. Clapp lived in Ramsey, New Jersey. 
And she prayed for Ramsey High School across the street from her home for 15 years that God would save the students in that high school and some of them would become missionaries. I want to encourage you with this story to pray for the schools in our community. You never know what God will do. And Mrs. Clapp, in those years, noticed a young man who became a student class president. His name was George Verwer. He was outgoing. He was an entrepreneur. He was a loudmouth. But she took note of him, and she put this young man on her prayer hit list. And she started to pray for him. And she sent her son, Dan, to George's house to put a gospel of John in the mailbox. And as George began to read God's word, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life, the Holy Spirit began to work on George. A few weeks later, one of his girlfriends invited him to come along and hear this southern preacher in Madison Square Garden. It was a one-night crusade, and that preacher was Billy Graham. And George thought, hey, it's free. I got a free ride. I get to go with my girlfriend. So they went to hear Billy Graham. And George said he sat way up in the back, like way up there where that guy's sitting way back there. He said, I don't remember a thing Billy Graham said, but when the invitation was given, the Holy Spirit grabbed my heart. And George Verra went forward that night and gave his life to Christ, and he was radically changed. He graduated from Ramsey High School, went back the next year, and shared his testimony to the student body. 125 students gave their lives to Christ, and he keeps up with many of them even to this day. <clears throat> George went on to Moody Bible College, and God put in his heart a passion, a burden for the people of the world that had never had a chance to read the Bible, the Word of God. And he began to mobilize students and cast vision. And after college, George and a group of students began to fan out around the world in that movement that became known as Operation Mobilization that today, conservatively estimated, has given the gospel to at least a billion people in the past 57 years. Today, with 6,800 workers from 105 different countries reaching out across the world, a movement that started with an ordinary housewife named Mrs. Clapp. You never know what God will do. Movements have small beginnings, but movements can have powerful impact. Your prayers, your finances, your obedience can result in God doing great things. We want to thank you, this church, for your support of those of us in OM. Our passion is establishing communities of Christ followers among the unreached, the forgotten, and we want to do that by mobilizing our generation to finish his mission, the mission that he gave us. And I want to share with you some of the things God is doing. The first place, it's very much on my heart, is the land of India. God is at work in India, 1.2 billion people. And one in every four Indians is known as a Dalit. The word Dalit means broken, crushed, oppressed. These are the people that are at the bottom, underneath the caste system, who for 3,000 years have been enslaved to the upper caste. It's basically institutional social slavery. They can't go to the temples. If their shadow falls on someone else, they become impure. They live in poverty. They live in bondage. About 15 years ago, God linked our leaders with a group of Dalits who wanted to be free from this caste system. We begin to share with them that the Bible offers a different worldview 
The Bible offers a different approach to life. And through a series of events, we begin to dialogue with the Dalit leaders and say, how can we serve your people? And they said, you can do two things. One, come and teach our children in English. Because English is the language of education, it's the language of higher education and of employment. <clears throat> Government, business, military, all these Areas are uh, based in English. So they said, come, and if you teach our children in English, they'll have a chance to come up in life, get a good job, and transform, break us out of this cycle of poverty. And so we begin to respond to invitations, and today we have 107 schools with 30,000 children studying and learning the values of God's word. One of those young women, her name is Pranitha. Pranitha lived in a little village near the city of Hyderabad, and she lived in what is called Pipe Village. It's a slum area where families literally lived in big sewer pipes. They just moved in and lived there, and we went to that area and we opened a school at the invitation of the Delete leaders. And Pranitha was one of the first little girls who started in lower kindergarten and went all the way through our school through 10th grade. And in those years, she learned English, she learned about Jesus, and she gave her life to Christ. And when she finished her school, she said, I want to go on to study and be a doctor so that I can come back to my village and my people and I can help them, I can serve them, I can show them that Jesus loves them. Today, Pranitha is in college studying to be a physician. Can you imagine thousands and thousands of Dalit children who go through school and become empowered? The gospel is moving, and around those schools, we begin to plant churches. Today, 4,000 churches are around the schools, and families are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's estimated across India over a million Dalits have come to faith so far. One of the fastest growing church planning movements in the world. <clears throat> and I want us to watch a video of a young girl named Rupa, a Dalit, that will show the power of the gospel to transform the lives of these people. Let's have the video. India is choking on garbage. The country generates over 100 million tons of waste a year and very little of it is treated. Often the trash is picked up by an army of so-called rag pickers or scavengers. Here's the story of one rag picker whose life and livelihood turned around after she had an encounter with Jesus Christ. It's been said the most beautiful people are those who've known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, and have found their way out of the depths. Rupa Raju is one of them. I've had a difficult life since my childhood and experienced more horrible things than most people my age. You see, at a young age, Rupa was forced by her parents to join the ranks of India's so-called rag pickers. These are men, women, and young children who rummage through filthy garbage heaps in the cities of India looking for anything that can be recycled and sold. Plastic, bottles, metal parts, pieces of glass, rotting discarded food. My day started at 4 or 5 in the morning and I picked trash for 10 to 12 hours. On a good day, she'd earn about $2 and that was a good day. Here on the streets where dogs were her only companion, and millions of squirming maggots, flies, rats, and crows, a constant distraction. She'd compete with other rat pickers for a few scraps. When I got older, my mother told me I wasn't bringing in enough money picking trash, so I was forced to sleep with men to bring more money. I became a prostitute. With tears welling up in her eyes, she describes the rage she felt toward her parents. I thought of running away. I didn't trust my parents. How could they do such a thing to me? I was angry. I wanted to kill them. I wanted something terrible to happen to them. 
Rupa is a Dalit, a so-called untouchable. Indian society labels Dalits lowest of the low, impure, less than human. Almost all rag pickers are Dalits. And like her, many young girls end up as prostitutes or get caught in a web of human trafficking. When I think about it, I begin to cry. But that's the past. Tonight's graduation night, and Rupa is all smiles. The Rupa of old is not the Rupa you see today. I cannot begin to explain to you what God has done in my life. She has God and Jivalin Kumar to thank for her transformation and this momentous evening. We really look forward to this night because uh, we see our women being liberated, being emancipated. Jivalin Kumar runs Tarika Women's Center, a Christian ministry that takes in, rehabilitates, and empowers scores of young women at risk. Almost two years ago, Rupa came to the center looking for help. Here, she got counseling, learned how to speak English, took sewing and computer classes, and eventually had her dignity restored. She also met dozens of other young women like herself who had similar life experiences. What I like to personally communicate to them is that I would never ever give up on any one of those women, no matter how many times they fall, because I know it is a struggle for them. Today, the Tarika Center is just one of a handful of Christian ministries operating here in India, trying desperately to rescue thousands of Dalit women from human trafficking and sexual bondage. For many of these victims, such ministries are a lifeline to a better future. Rupa says it was at the center she discovered with great delight her worth in God's eyes. I come from a Hindu background. I knew very little about Jesus Christ. When I came to Tarika, I started reading the Bible and then understood what freedom really means and how much I mean to God. Ultimately, it's the Bible's view of them that Kumar says brings lasting transformation. They can't believe it because all these years they've been told that they are lower than animals. And here we are telling them that they are created in the image of God. And that just hits them, that just blows them away. On a recent Friday evening, Rupa joined 105 women on stage for a graduation ceremony honoring their completion of an 18-month course at Tarika. And sitting in the audience that night were Rupa's mother and father. They told CBN News this was the proudest moment of their lives. The Tarika Center has done a great job. My daughter is a different person. I feel bad for the things we did to her, but now I want her to study well and have a good future. And perhaps it's this image of Rupa holding her father's hand that speaks volumes of one life transformed by the power of the gospel. She told CBN News later she's forgiven her parents for forcing her into prostitution. Every night before I go to bed, I thank God for Tarika Center. I thank God for rescuing me from my past. These days she works as a confident sales assistant in a large department store located on the most famous shopping street in the city. Same street, by the way, where she once picked trash. Her real desire, though, is to minister to broken and abused young women. There are many people who took care of me and showed love to me. I want to do the same for others. That will make me happy. George Thomas, CBN News, Bangalore, India. The power of the gospel to change a life. And all across India, there are millions like this. Let's continue to pray for India. <clears throat> God is also working in the Muslim world, shaking the foundations of Muslim nations through political upheaval, social revolution, natural disasters. As I've met with people in places like Lebanon and Syria, there's a disillusionment, and the rise of Islamic extremism has made many Muslims really wonder about their faith. Um, <clears throat> David Garrison who's a Southern Baptist uh, missionary, he wrote a book called A Wind in the House of Islam, and we've got the statistics for that book on uh, the screen. He did some research of Muslim people groups. Around the world, there are very distinct people groups, the Arabs and the Berbers and different people groups, thousands of them actually. 
And he discovered in his research that before 1980, he could only find two people groups that had seen 1,000 or more Muslims come to faith in Christ. Between 1980 and 2000, he discovered 10 groups. And as you can see, between 2000 and 2012, when the book was published, he found 64 different Muslim people groups where more than 1,000 had come to faith in Christ. God is working in the Muslim world. Even though we don't hear much about it, we hear the other side about Islam, but God is doing powerful things. <clears throat> in the North African country of Algeria, there's a people group there called the Kabyle Berbers, a Muslim people group. A missionary named Charles Marsh worked among them 37 years and saw virtually no fruit. He managed to translate the, the Bible into their language, and that was the legacy that he left to them. But today, over 100,000 Kabyle Berber Muslims have come to faith in Christ. In that part of Algeria, there are more churches than mosques in those communities. And there's a story of one man a Muslim man who was very ill. He'd been struggling with a disease for a long time. He had gone to the doctors. He had tried medicines, but it had not helped. He was in despair. He was in turmoil. He was in pain, and he didn't know what to do. He had been to all the Muslim wise men, and they could not help him. And one night in his sleep, this man had a dream. And in his dream, he dreamt a phone number. I don't know if you ever dreamt a phone number before. A lot of Muslims see visions of Jesus, but he saw a phone number. And when he woke up, the phone number was just emblazoned on his mind. He couldn't get it out of his head. And he kept talking about it. And finally, his wife said, just call the number. So he dialed the number and on the other end, someone picked up and said, hello, this is Rashid, how can I help you? Now Rashid happened to be an OM church planter in Algeria. And Rashid said, tell me your story. So he told him his story, and on the phone that day, Rashid counseled him and led him to faith in Jesus Christ and later went to visit him, and his family came to faith. The man was healed, and today there is a church in the village where this man lives. Did you realize the Holy Spirit knows your cell phone number? So... Watch out, you never know who's going to call. In Iran, it's estimated one million Iranians have come to faith since the 1979 revolution. All over the world today, there's a, a revival among Iranians. Afghanistan, the gospel is being beamed into Afghanistan by a group of Afghan believers every day and they tell us that on average, every month, they get 800 requests from Afghanistan to know more, to receive the Bible, how to receive Christ. And we know of groups of believers in Afghanistan. The gospel is growing in Turkey. In 1961, when OM went there, there were just a handful of believers. Now there are over 5,000 Muslim background believers, but that's still a drop in the bucket to 75 million, many whom have never heard the good news once. In the Middle East, we've heard a lot about the Syrian refugee crisis. A terrible, terrible crisis, a nation broken. One-third of Syrians are displaced from their homes, internally or externally. And I've had the privilege of going to Syria three times, and it's heartbreaking to see 
And yet through it all, through the heartbreak and the war and the crisis, God is at work. Many of these Syrians have fled to neighboring countries. And on a recent Sunday in Beirut, there was a pastor in church just like today, worshiping with his congregation, and as he went to go to the front to begin the sermon, he prepared his notes, and he noticed out in the audience a hand went up. And like a good pastor, he said, I see that hand. And uh, the man stood up and came forward, and he said, can I say something? And the pastor said, sure, go ahead. And the man said, I'm a Syrian, Muslim, My family and I, we came out of Syria, we came to Lebanon, and your church took us in. You began to care for us, you provided for us, you loved us, you played with our kids, you told us this message, and we've been worshiping with you for these weeks. And this morning, we want to tell you that we, as a family, have decided we're going to follow this Jesus Christ. The church was ecstatic. There was clapping and applause. And then another hand went up. That morning, nine Muslim background families came forward to say, we too want to follow Jesus. They would have never come to Christ in Syria. And yet God is working through all these events that we hear about. There's an untold story of the unstoppable world Christian movement among the nations. I could tell you many more stories, but I don't have time. What God is doing in the Arab world, opportunities for Americans to go in as students, as English teachers, as professionals, as engineers, to share Jesus Christ with Muslims in the everyday life. Opportunities that we would have thought unbelievable in the past exist today. God's also moving in the Buddhist world. You'll see a slide In Myanmar, one worker in Myanmar, a Buddhist country, reports that there are now 42,500 former Buddhists worshiping Jesus in 1,492 churches in that nation alone. And they come from 20 different people groups. God's working in the area of anti-human trafficking and modern-day slavery. Praise God, the church is rising up. More and more men and women are coming together and saying, this evil must stop. And our church has been on the forefront of that with ministries like Wellspring. All around the world, rescuing women and children from that kind of background. Girls like Rupa, who need to hear the gospel and be safe. Modern-day slavery is the third largest industry. First is drugs, then is arms dealing, and then is human trafficking. Every night, Rita and I watch the Dutch news because Rita's Dutch, and we like to keep up with what's going on in Holland and Europe. Almost every night, there are stories of, of people from Africa, people from the Middle East, in the thousands being trafficked across borders, across the sea, taken advantage of, locked in containers, many of these women will find themselves in prostitution. And it's the church of Jesus Christ that must rise up in a movement to bring the gospel to these people. There's another encouraging movement taking place around the world. We call it the Emerging Missions Movement. What God is doing in raising up his body around the world. You know, as Southern Baptists, since 1845, we've been sending missionaries, we've been giving money, we've been praying. What did we expect would happen? God has planted his church around the world in all those places where our missionaries went, and now those churches are sending out their own missionaries to join hands with us to reach the rest of the world that's waiting to hear the gospel. And that's very exciting. 
one of our workers who's in China. He's from Atlanta. He's a chemical engineer, and he's teaching business on a university level, and he's leading students to Christ. One of those students was a young girl. He led her to faith. She went and spent a year on the OM ship Lagos Hope to be discipled. Now she's in Texas studying with the Wycliffe Bible translators to go back to China and translate the Bible into one of the unreached people group languages of China. Koreans are being mobilized. Latin Americans are being raised up to go especially to the Muslim world because of the affinity that they have in culture. And our church is helping with that. There's a couple that have come from Brazil, Julio and Jill, and they've come with the vision of mobilizing the Latino church in America to take their part in reaching the world with the gospel. So when you see them, pray for them, encourage them, because God is using them. And then in Africa, OM alone has a vision to mobilize 5,000 African missionaries to go and reach unreached parts of Africa and beyond. And our church is playing a part in that as well. <clears throat> as we sponsor and support Grant and Gail Blair and their family. Because Grant has a key role in leading the personnel function of mobilizing and getting all these African missionaries to the different parts of the world. So we are on the forefront of seeing this emerging missions movement take place. Together, joining hands in this movement. But I said at the beginning, a movement has a goal. A movement has an end. What is the end of the world Christian movement. Well, we find that in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. After this I looked. There was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were robed in white with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. That's the goal. That's the end. That there would be some from every tribe and nation around the throne of God worshiping Jesus. The unstoppable world Christian movement. How are you involved in that movement. Our church is doing a lot. We have a group in Columbus right now. <clears throat> We're reaching out in different places. But as a church, let us not grow weary. Let's even redouble our efforts and realize that God wants to use us, our gifts, our talents, our resources to, to be a part of this movement that is his glory among the nations. He wants to use us. He wants to use students who will go into this world and live out their faith in this country and abroad. Maybe he wants to use your profession in a way you never thought possible. Maybe he wants you to be like Mrs. Clapp who faithfully prays for students across the street that they would become missionaries to the nations. God has given each of us gifts, talents, abilities, He's given us a purpose. How is your purpose contributing to his purpose for the nations? Is God calling you? We often wonder what can we do to make a difference? <clears throat> I'll close with this story of a lady named Mary. Mary was an ordinary American lady from Michigan who went to India on a short-term trip. And believe me, I, I am all about the power of short-term trips. They can change lives. And Mary went with a team from her church that was doing a medical camp in India. And there at the camp, <clears throat> she wasn't a doctor, she wasn't a nurse, 
but she was going up and down the lines because there's always lines of people waiting and just greeting the people, smiling. She couldn't speak their language. They couldn't speak her language, but just kind of being friendly to them. And as she went along, she connected with one lady in particular. And they, even though they couldn't communicate, they just hit it off. And that lady grabbed her hand and said, come with me, you know, just kind of led her on. And Mary wasn't supposed to leave the medical camp. They had told the team, don't wander away, but they were just connected. So she followed this lady and she led her down the the paths to her hut. And she brought her into her little hut there and sat her down and made her some tea and went and called her neighbors. And a few other ladies came into the hut and they just sat around holding hands and drinking tea. Well, the medical camp was finished. They packed everything up. They were ready to go, and they couldn't find Mary. Mary, where's Mary? And they went through the village shouting, Mary, Mary. And finally, Mary heard her name. She came out, and they said, we got to go. Come on. So Mary left, and they got in the van, went back to the city, and flew back to Michigan. The next week, a phone call came in to our office there in North India. And the caller said, I am from this village where you just had these Americans come and do a medical camp. He says, our village, we want to follow Jesus. And our guy said, what? We just did it. We didn't preach. We didn't do a crusade. How can you want to follow Jesus? And they said, this lady Mary, she came And she sat with these women and she held their hands to touch the untouchables. And they said, if Jesus is anything like Mary, we want to follow him. Sometimes we think we've got to preach, we've got to perform, we're so task-oriented when all God wants us to do is hold the hands of the untouchables and communicate his love. He can use you in those kind of ways, if you'll let him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this movement that's all about you. It's about your name. It's about your fame. It's about your glory among the nations. Lord, would you blow through the wind of your Holy Spirit that more and more people around the world would come to know you. In India, in the Muslim world, the Buddhist world, Lord, the secular world, in our country, Lord, that this great movement that we are a part of would never cease. Thank you that you allow us to be a part of it. Each and every one of us, help us find our place in your kingdom's work. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.